Hi guys, welcome to this video on training for strength. This video is going to be about the methods that you might be able to use in order to increase your strength. So we're going to talk about three main methods. Um, there are loads of different options and available um, ways of doing it. I'm just going to talk about three in this video. We're going to talk about pyramid training, eccentric training, and variable resistance training. So let's just begin by talking about what a standard training would look like. So in terms of standard um, strength training, a standard format would um, essentially be consistent reps and consistent loads for each set. So essentially, let's say that you're going to do three sets. Each of those sets will be identical. Um, so this is your standard kind of way. And there's absolutely nothing wrong with this. It's a great way of doing it. Um, tried and tested. No problem if you want to do things this way. That, that's absolutely great. But let's say you're going to do, uh, you're working at 70% of your one rep max in terms of the load. And you're going to do three sets. And each set is going to consist of six reps. Fantastic. No problem with that whatsoever. Okay. But. Um, it might get a little bit dull, it might get a little bit boring, and there are some other tweaks that you can make uh, to make things a little bit more interesting, but also perhaps to target uh, target the muscles in slightly new ways, uh, provoke some adaptation. So let's think about those. So in terms of pyramid training, first off then, um, what you'll notice with the pyramid training is that the set and are the same we've still got three sets but in terms of reps and load things have changed here compared to the standard training format so this is what we know as pyramid training and essentially what we're doing is there's a structured change of reps and loads for each set okay so whereas in in the previous example we have three sets and each set is identical to the previous set here now we're we're structuring the change of the reps you'll notice they either go up or down and the loads, which also either go up or down. Okay, so we're, we're deliberately doing this in order to provoke certain kind of strength adaptations. Essentially, if the load is increased, as it is as we move towards the top of the pyramid, you'll notice we go from 65, 70 to 85% of one rep max, the load is increasing. At the same time, the reps are dropped. But if we're coming down from the top of the pyramid, then the opposite is true. If the reps are increased, so from three to six to nine, then the load is dropped. OK, so we're, we're, we're playing off the load and the reps against one another. But what's really important to remember, because we're targeting strength as our um, component of fitness, uh, it's important to remember that the load should always stay close to, in order to hit strength as our, as our adaptation, the load should stay close to 70 to 80% of your one rep max and in that in that little corridor i guess uh, 70 to 80 percent that's where you need to be in order to be improving strength so um the, the reason for that is if you if you drop lower in terms of the load then you'll be targeting a muscular endurance or something else targeting it targeting different adaptations okay and so that's the key thing so try and, and make sure that with your training the the sets and reps and the load are organized in such a way uh, that you're still working on strength and so the key thing really is to make sure the load is somewhere between 70 and 80 percent of your one rep max if you want to go back to the um, strength training principles video for more on that uh, please feel free to do so I'll put I'll put the link in at this point so furthermore on pyramid training um, there's actually several different types of pyramid pyramid training. So we, we've we set up our pyramid here. We've got our three sets. Um, they differ in terms of reps and load, um, but we've still got our three sets. Now we can decide to do one of any uh, three options with this pyramid that we've set up. We can either have a pyramid that is ascending, a descending, or sometimes known as a reverse pyramid. Or we can use what's called a triangle pyramid, which sounds a bit daft because it's kind of almost saying the same thing twice, isn't it? But I'll explain what I mean by that just now. So we can have an ascending pyramid. We can have a descending pyramid or we can have a triangle pyramid. And each of these is determined by what's happening to the load. So as we progress from set to the next set to the to the next set, what is happening to the load? So the type of pyramid training that we're doing is defined according to the change in load. So, for example, if we are going to start at the bottom of the pyramid here, 
we're going to do nine reps at 65 percent of our one rep max we're going to do that set and we're obviously going to take a break three minutes four minutes depending on how long uh, the set took us um, we're going to have a decent long break because we don't want to work on muscular endurance. We want to work on strength. So we have a long break and then we go into our, our second set. If the load for our next set is increasing, then we are doing an ascending pyramid, an ascending pyramid. So if the load is going up from set to set, if the load is going up, we are doing an ascending pyramid. If, however, the load is coming down, so we'll start with the three reps at 85% of one rep max, and we come down, we do the three reps at 85%, then six at 70%, then nine at 65%, what we're doing there is a descending pyramid, a descending pyramid. Um, again, because we're defining our pyramid according to the change in load, in load. Now, just quickly here, a descending or reverse pyramid is not the same thing as a drop set. Um, because a drop set is a is to failure, but descending or reverse pyramids are specific um, specific numbers of reps that you've worked out in advance. So a drop set is where you go to failure. This is a descending or a reverse pyramid, which is somewhat different. Um, the descending pyramid um, is generally regarded as preferable uh, for strength training, but you can mix it up. It's fine. And the reason it's generally preferred is because you're not fatigued on your heavier set. Um, whereas if you go ascending, then you're at risk of being fatigued on your heavier sets and putting yourself at risk. However, if you do descending, obviously you're going to start with the heavier loads and, and come down um, in terms of load. Um, so starting with that obviously requires you to have a really good warm up. Now, if you were to combine these two, if you were to go um, from the nine reps at 65 percent and up to 85 percent and then back down again, then you're doing what is known as a triangle pyramid set or a triangle pyramid training, I should say. So ascending is where the load increases through the sets. Descending is where the load comes down through the sets and a triangle pyramid, which again sounds a bit daft. A triangle pyramid is where you go up and then down in terms of load and basically up and then back to where you started. So the second type of training is eccentric training, and this is commonly referred to as negatives or negative training. Um, and essentially what you're going to do here is you're going to start at the end of the movement and slowly, and I've said three, four, five seconds here, slowly perform the eccentric phase and only the eccentric phase into the normal starting position for whatever movement is you're making. So for the example here with the, with the chin up, um, you're going to start off in the position that you can see on the screen and you're going to lower yourself down, um, controlling through eccentric contractions, controlling against the, the pull of gravity, lower yourself down to the ground. You're not going to add in the concentric phase by pulling yourself back up. Instead, you're going to perhaps stand on a bench or stand on a chair to put yourself back into the, the starting position, <laughs> which you can see on the screen, which is the normal end position. So we switch them around. So we're going to start our eccentric training in the normal end point of the movement. And we're going to lower down under gravity, under control in the eccentric phase um, towards what would normally be, if we were doing concentric movements, what would normally be the starting position. The reason for this is our muscles can produce greater force under eccentric contraction than they can under concentric contraction. So in fact, what we're able to do in eccentric training or negatives training is we're able to stress the muscles to a greater extent because we can add a little bit more load because we're focusing only on the eccentric movement or the eccentric part of the phase of the movement rather than the concentric phase of the movement. So what you'll need to do, therefore, is you'll need to select a load that is just beyond what you can achieve concentrically for that number of reps. OK, select a load that's just beyond what you can achieve concentrically for that number of reps. So if you've got a particular load that you can bench for five reps and you know that's kind of your roughly your limit, you can nudge up above that slightly as long as you're only using the eccentric phase of the contraction. Now, obviously, there's a certain amount of risk here, um, and that's why I've said here you're probably going to need a spotter uh, to do eccentric training for um, at least a lot of um, training where we're, we're, it's not body weight stuff. You can do body weight eccentric training, 
Um, but if we're loading stuff onto onto bars, I very strongly recommend that you have a spotter to help you out with this. So the next method then for training for strength is called variable resistance training. And this is also sometimes known as accommodating resistance training. So in variable resistance training or VRT, uh, the resistance provided by the load changes as you move the load. So it actually changes within the rep. OK, so you're not changing the load after you've you've done your set move the load onto something else like you would do in pyramid training we in variable resistance training the load is actually or the resistance is changing as the load is being moved within the rep and so there's various ways we can achieve this um, the main ways are rubber based resistance so rubber bands of different sorts chains cam and lever systems and that sort of thing so how does it work well um, different lifts and different movements have different strength curves, different strength curves. And what that means is, uh, without getting too technical at this point, is that because of the change in the relationship between force production uh, and mechanical advantage, there are parts of the lift that are harder and parts of the lift that are easier. So you'll, you'll no doubt know this, that it, whatever lift it might be, different parts of the lift are easier than other parts. So at the points where the musculoskeletal system has what's known as mechanical advantage, that is the setup of the levers of the body, is advantageous at that point in the movement, then where there's mechanical advantage, then less muscular force production is needed. And vice versa, the points where the musculoskeletal system is at a mechanical disadvantage, then we need to produce more force production in order to move uh, the, the weight or the load in that particular lift and there are three main types of strength curves and you'll see why I'm going through this in just a second and the three um, main types of curve are ascending strength curves descending strength curves and bell shaped or parabolic strength curves and each of these types of strength curve um, corresponds with different lifts but they basically tell us where or at what point in that lift is the point of mechanical advantage, the bit that's the easiest bit, basically. So in an ascending strength curve, um, the relationship between the force needed and the mechanical advantage where the, where the body's lever systems um, are, the point of mechanical advantage, the easy point in an ascending strength curve is the end point. So whatever movement, I'll give you some movement examples in just a second, but whatever the movement is we're thinking of, if it has an ascending strength curve, it means the start is the tricky bit. And then once you get past the start, it becomes easier as you move through towards the end of the movement. So some examples of that would be deadlifts, where getting the bar off the ground initially is, is the hardest part and the last little bit is the easiest part. Same with a chest press, same with a squat. And those are sorts of um, ascending curves ascending strength curve movements that we often refer to as having a sticking point and usually the sticking point is early on in the movement because that's the point where there's the least mechanical advantage so an ascending strength curve has mechanical advantage at the end a descending strength curve you could probably fill these blanks in already um, has the point of mechanical advantage the point that's the easiest part of the lift is at the start of the lift or the start of the movement so some examples of those would be a seated row so the initial part of the movement is easier and then as you work through the movement to complete the movement it becomes tougher uh, same with a, a lap pull down for example so that would be a descending strength curve and a bell curve is um, where the point of mechanical advantage is somewhere in the middle of the movement so the start of the movement's tricky the middle of the movement's easy and then the end of the movement is tricky again in terms of the force production required and it's all to do with mechanical advantage and the, and the body's lever system. So some examples would be bicep curls, hamstring curls, um, that sort of thing. So what variable resistance training or accommodating resistance training does is it targets the point of the lift with, with rubber bands or chains or whatever. It targets the point of the lift where there is mechanical advantage in order to maintain or even increase muscle stimulation beyond what would normally be required at that point of the lift. So we're going to try and increase resistance at the point of mechanical advantage and maybe even unload it 
elsewhere in the movement. So how do we actually do this then? So you might, for example, attach resistance bands to each end of a barbell and hook those under the feet of the squat rack. So then as you lift, the resistance that's provided by the bands means that the muscles are working harder towards the end of the lift, even though they have got a mechanical advantage at that point. So this would be for an ascending strength curve. So for example, again, during the ascent phase of an ascending strength curve lift, so a deadlift, chest press, a squat, as we've said, the musculoskeletal system gains a mechanical advantage. And so force production normally would decrease towards the end of the movement, but by adding the band, the additional tension then has the potential to increase muscle stimulation and motor unit recruitment towards the end of the lift. And, and so that ensures that the muscles are still producing significant force, even through the last portion of the lift. Now, obviously your maximum lift is limited um, under normal circumstances to whatever weight you can get past the weakest part of the lift, which means you might not be providing sufficient load for the stronger parts of the lift to cause strength adaptations in that part of the movement. Now that's not a problem if you're a competitive power lifter, for example, and, and the lift is what you do as part of your competition. But if you're using deadlifts for something else, i.e. you're using deadlifts, for example, to increase your overall muscle strength right through the range of motion, then it's something you might want to think about working around. Because if the sticking point isn't necessarily an issue and actually you want to increase strength later on in the lift, at least in this example with ascending strength curves, then variable resistance training can be really helpful. Um, again, also known as accommodating resistance training, and it can overcome this issue um, so you can maintain this uh, force production later on, even though you're at the point of mechanical advantage where normally the muscles kind of ease off a little bit because that part of the lift is easier. One last little note on this type of training, um, variable resistance training, particularly and specifically really rubber based resistance training is really useful for strength training in planes other than sagittal. So I, they're not gravity dependent movements. So because the reason for this is you can basically attach a rubber band pretty much anywhere that, that you can attach it to, you know, you can attach it to all sorts of places. You can attach it above you. You can attach it to the side. So you can be working on strength in a plane other than what's gravity dependent. So really quickly, what equipment can we use for strength training? Well, the most obvious one would be free weights. But then if we want to adapt things to uh, variable resistance, we might need to look at resistance machines, resistance bands, chains, and so on. I'm not going to get into the use of each of these individually, um, but you'll be able to think through having a, a good understanding of the principles behind strength training, hopefully the effective use of each of these types of equipment. So that's it for methods for training for strength. I hope that's been helpful. If you've got any further questions, if you want me to clarify anything, please um, drop your questions in the comments section and I'll get back to you. Other than that, hope that's been helpful to you. I'll see you in the next video. Enjoy the rest of your day.